sehr, dass es uns gelungen ist, die gebürtige Chinesin und Professorin an der London School of Economics and Political Science, Kiyu Tsin, bei uns heute zu begrüßen. Und sie wird befragt von Dirk Schütz, Chefredakteur der Bilanz. Herzlich willkommen an Sie beide. Thank you very much and good morning, Keiju. And good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here from Bilanz as well. It's my pleasure to introduce Keiju this morning. She was born in Beijing and she moved to New York at the age of 14. She then went to Harvard, where she earned a bachelor, a master's degree, and a PhD in economics. She served as an advisor to the IMF, to the World Bank, and to the Federal Reserve of New York and is now, as Christine already mentioned, an assistant professor at the London School of Economics, specializing in international macroeconomics and the Chinese economy. She also has a mandate that is leading her to Switzerland quite often. She's a board member of Richemont, the global luxury goods, com goods company headquartered in Geneva. Now we have the pleasure to listen to her and her pers perspective will be the Chinese one, the big challenges the Chinese economy is facing. The floor is yours. It's a pleasure to listen to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's an honor and privilege to be with you uh, today, uh, albeit virtually, uh, to share with you the latest developments and perspectives of China, particularly at a time when travel is made much more difficult, borders are as thick as the length of quarantine required for entry, when each nation is fighting their own battle of health crises and economic downturns and dealing with an increasingly divisive society. So today, we need to find more common ground than stress the differences. And success of collaboration critically relies on understanding each other's perspectives. So it is my hope to tell you a bit more about the tra profound transformations uh, that is going on uh, in China today from the inside um, as I've just come back from China after being there for more than a year and a half uh, a month ago back uh, to Europe. Um, let me start with what Deng Xiaoping, our great leader uh, in the 1970s uh, said when he was about to launch the opening up and reform program, which has so fundamentally changed the landscape of the Chinese economy, he said, let some people get rich first, and then let these people lift the tide so that all boats can rise. So now is the time. Now is the time that many people uh, have gotten rich, and I would say have gotten very rich, and now is the time to let the whole nation prosper um, based on the foundation that they have laid out for everyone else. So I believe that we are witnessing the most profound transformation in China since the late 1970s uh, with the reform process. Today, it is about common prosperity, the umbrella name common prosperity, which means middle income uh, opportunities, expanding the middle class and raising their income. Uh, it's interesting that the Chinese government has observed the squeeze in the middle uh, of uh, income levels in the West and particularly in the United States and say, no, we do not want that. Instead, we want an olive-shaped, olive-shaped uh, income distribution where most of the income is attributed uh, to the middle class. It's also about the small and medium-sized companies rather than letting the resources, power, profits all be concentrated in very large companies that wield monopoly power. It is about letting the smaller companies flourish and for them to develop an expertise, a range of sophisticated and refined products that can help the Chinese um, exports in terms of upgrading uh, the products that they sell to the rest of the world. Um, so there's a profound shift in the paradigm and the paradigm has shifted from this blindless, fervent, ferocious pursuit of GDP growth and investment and efficiency to social welfare, 
consumer welfare and consumer protection. For a long period of time, as we know about the Chinese economy, it was deemed to be unbalanced because the household sector did not uh, grow proportionally to the national income. Its income share was declining. Uh, the rate of saving, the rate of return of its saving, uh, which was stacked in uh, either the stock market or the bank uh, deposits, uh, were earning uh, an average of zero real rate of return. And in turn, they have subsidized the big companies to expand, to industrialize, and also the state uh, to undertake its momentous projects. But today, eyes are focused on the consumers. It's all about social welfare and social protection. And this is why I believe the West has too liberally interpreted these transformations that are going on in China. I even heard uh, briefly from the previous session the question of uh, you know, the Chinese drive to the left, Chinese government potentially driving out the private businesses, we're going after the billionaires as is uh, popularly uh, depicted in Western media. This interpretation is too liberal and borderline wrong because today, it is about harnessing the consumers. Now, let's take the education sector as an example. The Chinese government, in a sweeping 20 to 30 uh, uh, regulatory uh, moves uh, over the last year, uh, has come in to regulate and uh, penalize big companies, including education companies, technology companies, and a range of other companies under the name of uh, data privacy protection, uh, uh, regulation of monopolies, and social protection and welfare. But this is a genuine uh, uh, undertaking. It comes from genuine motivations to give back to the consumers. Now, one of the grandest um, ironies in contemporary Chinese society is the hyper-competition in the education sector, where children are lugging around suitcases every morning to go to school because their backpacks can't fit all the books they need to read in one day. When uh, all students, regardless of your income levels and your parents' income levels, take an average of two to three to even up to eight tutorials outside of school, filling their weekends and schedules. And uh, to the observation that the most popular TV show today in China is about their kids and how to get their kids into the right schools. Uh, this is the most common factor causing unhappiness in contemporary Chinese society. And this is something uh, that President Xi, acutely sensitive to so social tensions and social eruptions, have been trying to be fi fix or have attempted to fix, um, uh, even starting from years ago, or had the idea planted in his mind that education sector needs needs to be regulated. This is the best instance showing you, you know, the interesting thing is that um, it is actually business that have brought the human condition to be much better for hundreds of millions of people to have lived much better lives. And for those people to have children who have better prospects in Europe and the United States, less than 50% of the new generation is going to live better lives than parents. That's shocking. In China, almost 100% of the new generation is going to live better lives than their parents. You know, the interesting thing about human rights as we talk about and debate it is very fascinating because in China, and here we're giving the Chinese perspective, they're watching the world aghast. Thousands dying all the time and every day in the United States, 2,000 people dying every day because of government incompetence. This is something that the Chinese people will never be able to accept and a huge violation of what they consider human rights. So I think the cultural awareness, the cultural differences, the cultural preferences are so differently manifested around the world that we need to have an open mind to appreciate what they are and ask the Chinese people and you will get your answer. And hence the focus on the Chinese people is part of the, the talk. Um, big tech um, manipulating consumer interests, using misusing their privacy, there's, um, uh, their data. These are not just problems that are faced by the Chinese. Uh, you know, we have been discussing about big companies, technology comp companies like Facebook and the problems that they have created for society for all this time and little has been done. But in the Chinese government, that's not the case. With sweeping dramatic moves, they are able to make changes. They are able to enact uh, diff different things overnight. Even companies like Meituan, uh, which was penalized for not treating their workers uh, fairly is 
is undergoing huge scrutiny. This is real action. The Chinese government has canceled the so-called 996 work ethic, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week for the young children so they can have a better life. These, this is progress. This is China going from a capitalist-driven, economic growth-oriented society to a more balanced, equitable society, get rid of illicit income. The China doesn't want to be like the US, huge amounts of inequality, huge corporate lobbying, uh, the corporate powers that uh, can um, sway policy in their favor at the cost of consumers. This is not what China wants to be. China doesn't want to be like the US, uh, the Europe either, large welfare states, uh, universal uh, coverage. No, China believes in actively promoting work, rewarding work, uh, as which is one of the fundamental virtues in the Chinese culture. It wants to choose its own path, and it is doing it. It is tackling the Western capitalism's most intractable problem ahead of the West. For a long period of time, the West has criticized China over corruption, and now corruption, the anti-corruption campaign has been so successful, uh, it's being criticized for its political concentration, which was needed to tackle corruption. Uh, China has been criticized for having an imbalanced economy uh, away from the consumers, and now China is shifting its uh, power back to the consumers, and it is being criticized for driving out the businesses. But this is not true. Just look at the facts. Last year, there were more than 400 companies going public that needs to be approved by the Chinese government. It's approval system, but 80% of them were private businesses. And for every unhappy billionaire that has to contribute a bit more to philanthropy, as they should, and work with the government, there are many, many more happy millionaires who now have a better shot at becoming a billionaire because there's more regulation at the very top and for the big companies. So ask the Chinese people what they think. These are hugely popular policies, but they're not alien. They are exactly the kind of problems that the West want to tackle at the same time, curbing inequality, getting rid of illicit income, giving for fair opportunities to the middle class, um, and making the society more harmonious. Uh, but it is not just about the 1% in China. China does not focus on the 1% as is the case in the US. Uh, it doesn't focus on necessarily taxing the rich to get away, to get at more equitable opportunities. It's taking a different set of methods. It's increasing the supply of housing for uh, lower income households. It is uh, pairing up cities, a poor city and a rich city in a province so that they can do more joint projects together to reallocate some of the resources to reduce urban rural inequality. It goes so much further beyond than just overhauling a tax system to tax the rich because it is not just about that. It is also about pre-distribution, giving access to health, health care um, and uh, good education. So these are common problems facing any of capitalist societies, but China is taking a more dramatic approach. And of course, the big conjecture is, is it going to be successful? I'm not here to make that uh, um, bet at this point. It all depends on implementation. And that's a big if. It could be, there could be an overdrive where the overdrive of these policies will slow down growth and really reduce the incentives of the private businesses. But if done well, there could be more opportunities, not less. There could be more quality growth, not less. There will be more innovation from small, medium-sized firms, not less because the big companies, as we've seen in the United States, have suppressed innovation of these smaller companies for all this time. The entrepreneurial spirit, even today, is very much alive. And I can attest to that, being on China on the ground for the last two years. Um, we have a saying. Uh, in China to glorify our ancestors. It's not just about making money, it's about having an impact on society. It was no less than John Stuart Mill that said, the idea is essentially repulsive of a society held together only by the relations and feelings arising out of pecuniary interest. Let me end by saying China is fashioning its own economic model called China's modern socialism. But whatever the name, whatever the label, um, it may sound like it's a vastly different system and paradigm, but at the heart of it, it is not too much different from the ideals that we're pursuing here in the Western capitalist societies. 
perhaps a little bit more state than is tol tolerable or palatable here, perhaps a bit more effective at getting a fair society than the democratic process that is required uh, in this part of the world, perhaps a little less corporate power than in the United States, and a bit less of universal welfare provision than in Europe. It has chosen a set of their own preferred values. And here, we, I really want to emphasize, culture is so vastly manifested to be different across, across countries, as we've seen uh, during the pandemic and after the pandemic. But China is still open to business. China is still welcoming of foreign participation. Leaders in the West should not push China in the wrong direction so that everyone loses in the end, particularly the people. It is by understanding the Chinese perspective, why it's different and where these differences stem from, and suspend our suspicions arising out of inherent biases, and rather use facts and data, engage in smart diplomacy, and only then can the world be a safer place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keiju, for this very optimistic outlook on China. My uh, first question would be, uh, you said uh, China is still open for business. How far did the whole pandemic uh, lead to the fact that the country may be more inward looking, that the business flows uh, with uh, foreign countries are much more difficult now? Uh, how far does this really impact the, the uh, relationship to, to, to Western countries as far as business is concerned? Well, again, if we take the facts and data, it gives a very different picture from what we perceive. Uh, despite the trade war, trade flows are at all time highs uh, with other countries. Um, despite uh, the, the cutting off of uh, investments, or so to speak, sensitive investment, FDI uh, in 2020 was the largest inside China, flowing to giant China than any other country. So we have to separate the rhetoric, rhetoric from the action, and it is really big comfort. The data shows that economic cooperation is very much in place. Now, of course, you're absolutely right that the zero COVID policy and the pandemic has uh, prevented further uh, business dealings and cooperation uh, uh, in China, between China and the West in particular, and that is a big concern. I'm concerned about this because of um, the push to deglobalization de is even uh, stronger. However, um, the kind of opening up that uh, I'm, I was referring to and that is very prevalent and, and clear is financial services opening up. So financial institutions, especially um, Europe and in the US, are embracing all these new opportunities in China to do more business as wholly owned foreign enterprises, uh, engaging with the Chinese consumers because they need to have their assets be managed. Wealth management is a big business and a big hole in China, insurance companies, et cetera. So on this front, the government is totally committed to opening up further and working more with the West. When do you expect uh, regular travel to be back uh, like uh, before the pandemic? Uh, regular travel is uh, not going to be like before the pandemic for some while to come until the you know the Chinese people's psychology is normalized. The Chinese government wants a little bit less control, and they they learn to live with COVID, which will take time. Mm -hmm. We also heard this morning that uh, China is getting old before it's getting rich. Uh, this is one of the main challenges. Um, how do they tackle this uh, demographic challenge? Um, first of all, I completely don't agree with this, uh, with this uh, statement. Uh, first of all, it was not demographics that led China on the way up, so it should not be the reason why China should be going down. Um, but also, we have absolutely no evidence around the world that demographics is a leading macroeconomic factor that has caused um, uh, you know, economic downturns or asset price changes. We don't, you know, lots of things are going on in aging societies at the same time, uh, uh, leading to economic pressures. Um, but also, most importantly, we have to emphasize labor productivity and labor efficiency, Just not, not just the number of people. Um, uh, as an example, a person uh, of a new generation earns about six times the income uh, of their parents at this stage. And they're much, much more efficient. So you have to look at the effective size of the population. And of course, we have seen that they're not, we're, we're debating the fact that there are not enough jobs around, right? And now we're talking about there's, there's, you know, there's um, uh, uh, not a job, jo enough jobs to go around, but also there will be more robots, more adaptation to the demographic structure, just like Japan. Uh, 
the question is really about pension sustainability. And here I want to draw to an interesting Chinese cultural phenomenon, which is this intergenerational transfer. Parents rear children, give them everything they can. This is why we see the overcompetition education, because parents want to give all the resources to the kids. And in turn, the children take care of the parents when they grow old. We have all of this evidence in the data and everyday life. So this makes intergenerational transfer from the social um, uh, welfare system, pension system, a little bit different from the rest of the world. As you are mentioning uh, the children, uh, it's already our final question. Uh, I think a lot of uh, parents here in Europe and in the US, they were very happy about this uh, Chinese solution of limiting access time to smartphones. Uh, why did, you, did they do that in China and does it work? Did, do they really get off their kids from the smartphones? Um, well, the two observations. The first observation is China is a totally paternalistic society. And this is not just between the people and the authority, but also between the parents and their children. I can be a test to that. The second observation is that the Chinese, even from when they're very young, are very entrepreneurial and they can always spot loopholes. So they're using their grandparents' identities to play video games uh, on, uh, on, uh, online. But still, I think there is still a great deal of effectiveness. Uh, the government just did what the, the parents would have liked somebody to do. Um, and I know that that's caused Causing some admiration or envy from the rest of the world. It does. Thank you very much for your time.